What I've discovered um, is that part of loving myself is being honest with myself about what I hate about myself, um, because then it can at least be acknowledged and felt um, and can be aired. Yes. Um, and what a lot of people misperceive is that loving themselves is telling themselves positive things about themselves all the time. But what I've found is being ruthlessly honest with ourselves um, and and being and having the courage um, to allow for that is probably the greatest self-love we can um, direct towards ourselves. What if your problem is not what you think it is? More often than not, we find ourselves stuck in our heads. And so we try to navigate through stressful situations using our mind. We become stuck with patterns of thinking that are just that. Patterns that cause us to spiral down the same rabbit hole. Sometimes, all it takes from us is to loosen our grip a little and open up our heart. Sometimes, we just need to feel our way through a problem. Welcome to another episode of the Soul Space Podcast. We are your hosts, Adrian and Thel. Today, we interview Toronto-based executive coach, Jonathan Varkle. Jonathan helps people in leadership positions address problems from the inside out. For over 20 years, he navigated the corporate world as a chartered accountant and an operations executive. In today's episode, Jonathan talks to us about his journey with anxiety, which sparked a deep transformation in his approach to life and work. It is our pleasure to bring you Jonathan Varkle. Thank you for joining us, Jonathan. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the, for me, I feel like one of the challenges with, with these meetings is, is there's no shortage of things to explore. And that, and that to me sometimes brings a little bit of anxiety. It's sort of like, okay, what do we want to uh, prioritize as far as, you know, time and that sort of thing. Um, but I'm sitting here and sort of just tuning in to myself and, I'm getting the sense that I, I'm really drawn to, to hearing your personal story again. I know you've shared it with me, but I think, I think that'll be a good place to start for listeners to kind of bring in, um, you know, what it is that we're going to be uh, just diving into today. But if you can share your journey as far as um, where you grew up and, and sort of beginning your, your professional life and, and how that took, you know, some changes. And well, wow. <laughs> That's, um, that's an interesting question, um, apropos your whole um, starting point with anxiety, because um, it's very much a, a story of, um, of ang- about anxiety. Um, it's about um, not realizing um, I was ever really anxious. It's about, um, um, it's about being very adept at all kinds of things. And so not having to deal with anxiety necessarily. Um, call it a functional anxiety person. Um, so I, I grew up um, in South Africa um, during the apartheid years, actually, um, which may be why energetically there's a fair amount of anxiety in the, um, in the space I grew up. Um, and I um, was in, uh, grew up in Cape Town. Um, the tip of uh, Africa there, and uh, really a spectacular landscape. Um, really, really, really quite beautiful. And uh, had in, in many ways an idyllic childhood because, I mean, what did we do? We just went to the beach and went to school and I played sport and hung out with my friends and it all seemed really um, quite, um, quite wonderful. Um, and in 1987, um, my uh, whole family, I was 19 at the time, my, um, my whole family moved to Canada 
um, things had gotten really unstable politically. Um, there was a lot more violence. Um, and the economy seemed to be um, unstable. Have you been anywhere else in Africa? Yes, I've actually been to nine countries in Africa. Where? Um, starting in uh, Kenya mm -hmm. um, and going across to Uganda and then down, mm -hmm. um, mostly the East Africa, so Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, um, yeah. and, and, and yeah. the countries down below. Yeah, my, my father is, is from Sudan, my grandma from Eritrea, and my mother from Yemen. Her wow. Yeah, I know. So you got the full. And, and <laughs> have you been to Africa? I have been to Sudan in the late 80s, and that was the one time I went. It was 89, 80, yeah, and I got really sick, and it was the one time. So I just wanted to share that. <laughs> there's, there's something quite remarkable yeah. about the, the landscape. Mm -hmm. um, in Africa, mm -hmm. um, and it smells and feels completely different mm. to North America. It just really does. And um, and um, so it's definitely part of is, your psyche. Yeah, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. I can totally relate. In fact, yeah. what's really weird is, I mean, I've I have traveled a, a fair amount mm -hmm. and spent some time in India as well. And it was very weird because a lot of people would always talk about getting really culture shocked when they go to India, mm. and for the weirdest reason, landing in India and just. Um, getting off the plane and walking out into the streets, um, mm. it didn't feel culture shock at all for yeah, me. It was yeah. a very weird thing. And, and that's not because it's African in any way, but yeah. there's something culturally about um, the, the space that kind of spoke to me in a way that just felt very, oh, this is, this is home in a way. I oh, felt yeah. kind of quite home. Yeah. It's kind of cool. So, it's so then coming to Canada must have been a culture shock for you, which is interesting because, you know, you look a specific way and for you to have a culture shock here would... <laughs> crazy because people said to me like so did you have an issue with the language like no language mm -hmm. um so there was some culture shock mm -hmm. but nothing really i'd say negative mm. it's culture shock in the way that's weird how you do that i mean i remember one of the first things that um that i noticed that i thought was so weird was that um it just comes to me right now was just the um the newspapers were put in the the boxes on the side of the street and you could put in a quarter or whatever it was to take the newspaper out and i thought We'd never have that in South Africa. Someone's mm -hmm. just going to take all the newspapers at once and then start selling them themselves. Yeah. Like they would never have the honor that. system. Yeah, the honor system. It's just very different. And um, and and so the, the 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 African person in me was like, "That's that's nuts. How do you get away with that?" And yet it absolutely worked perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> it's just uh, really yeah. really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, the. Um, the culture shock wasn't in a, in a way where I was 19. Mm -hmm. I was I went straight to university, so there there really isn't a whole lot for me to 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 say about that in a sense that it was so that so impactful. I actually, in many ways, um, felt a few things that were were what some people would have thought is is weird. Is I felt more free, mm -hmm. which is a weird thing because I go, dude. You're a white male from South Africa in apartheid. Like, how unfree could you have felt? But the funny thing is, mm. um, is that genuinely, um, I really did. And the question is, well, what kind of free did I feel? Because I don't know. It wasn't like um, um, anything I could totally put my put my finger on. But I'd say there was a lot of different little things, and it all adds up. Um, it's the free that I didn't have to be looking around me all the time from a crime perspective. Um, it's the free that I, when I was doing a Bachelor of Commerce degree, I could choose breadth requirement courses and not just be only doing commerce degree as in, in South Africa at the time. Um, and it was the free that everything felt so possible. I remember the first summer and I went and got a job in, uh, the, in a warehouse in shipping and receiving in a furniture warehouse and it just felt like the easiest thing to do like it was like there's a process for it and you just can do it and mm -hmm. if you want to do something there was something to help you get it done and it everything just felt so much more doable and easy and manageable um it's a shift from like a world where there was so many po polarities really and and now you're in a world where your options have opened up it sounds significantly like it. yes yeah. significantly yeah. absolutely 100 percent. it was like either yes or no black yeah. or white right or wrong and this was just one big thing of, well, what do you want to do? Yes, like, yeah. really? Right? I don't know if it's right. I don't know if it's wrong. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. And uh, very, very different experience, for right. sure. Like inner liberation, inner freedom. Yeah. Inner liberation, inner freedom, all of it. And yeah. so for a while, actually, um, life was amazing. 
um, it was great. I mean, I, I fed off that whole whole experience, and um, and then um, I would say that I rode that wave till um, till two thousand around the Y two K thing. I got it. I was in um, software, um, and um, we've been um, doing a fair amount of. Um, system installation around the whole Y2K problem and everyone thought that planes were going to fall out of the sky and all that kind of stuff and people were putting uh, cans of uh, food and bottles of water in their basement thinking that everything was just going to It was to the end of the world. It was the end of the world. <laughs> and uh, yeah, <laughs> so I remember that and I remember um, my, my ex-wife and I um, at the time um, decided we were going to go traveling and um, quit our jobs and sell our house and... Um, And we said we would do it after January 2000 because that's when the planes would have fallen already and now we could go and <laughs> fly wherever we wanted to fly. And so um, we went traveling and that's in, in that time, that's really where I um, did the nine countries in Africa thing. Mm -hmm. um, before that, having lived in South Africa, I'd only touched on two other countries in Africa. And so it was interesting that I had to leave South Africa to then become more worldly and go traveling and so nine countries in Africa was part of that as some of um, Southeast Asia and um, Europe. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't have a specific time for when we were going to come back and I think what was really amazing was I was on this great trajectory before um, having achieved some management position in a consulting company and I thought wow my life's going somewhere and it felt good and I built this whole thing and, um, and yet um, it seemed like an exciting, fun thing to do that we could just take off some time and just go traveling and then see what happens. Um, and so there wasn't... Uh, interestingly enough, um, if, um, it, was a, it was a time when there was a fair amount of anxiety that, that had cropped up because just before we went away, I started to have um, uh, vertigo issues. Massive amounts of spinning, um, couldn't actually um, function properly. Um, would go to the hospital every now and then to just get infusions of, say, like whatever the um, liquids were, because I had basically um, vomited every single thing in my system up because I couldn't, um, I couldn't actually um, function properly from the spinning in my head. So I was eventually diagnosed with this thing called Meniere's disease, which is an inner ear condition. And suffice to say that I actually don't know what causes it, don't know what triggers it, and don't know what leads to anything. So it wasn't really a hope. But evidently, um, an elevated system anxiety was one of the things that people seem to think triggers it. So obviously, despite the fact that the trip was going to be very exciting, and despite the fact that we um, were selling our house and had no, you know, um, ties in a particular kind of way and I didn't have to work and there wasn't really a financial pressing need. Um, despite all that, at some level, there was obviously something deeply disturbing in going traveling, even though it was the most exciting thing in the world, which is quite interesting. So um, I still kind of um, went, on, I went on the trip and had to manage the symptoms for a little while while going on the trip and it slowly started to subside while on the trip. Um, it may have actually been um, six months in India doing yoga that may have <laughs> led to, a bit of yoga. to, to, uh, yeah, to, uh, to, to shifting that a bit. Um, but we only came back to, to Canada um, a year and a half after um, we left because we'd never set a time period and it felt like we were done, ready mm -hmm. to come back. And um, after we came back, um, I didn't know what I was going to do next. And um, an opportunity presented itself where I would, um, where I was asked to help build the infrastructure of a of a company, um, in the automotive space. And the idea was that well, we're small, we're about 10, 15 people, and we're looking to grow really fast. And we don't have any infrastructure. We don't have systems. We don't have processes. We don't have people organized in a particular kind of way. And you come in and see if you can help us figure that out. Um, and so that, again, really exciting, really, really exciting. But yet again, the same um, underlying anxiety around, um, wow, this, this is the next thing. Um, so on the one hand, it felt um, really purposeful. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, it felt, um, it felt at first 
no pressure. And then suddenly, after about a month in, it felt like I got to make something happen here, mm -hmm. and started to feel the the pressure of of that. Um, and I can now remember biologically what that did for me was my whole system then ramped up. Mm. I actually remember that now. It's really interesting. Um, my system just totally ramped up, geared up. I went into that um, corporate warrior mode. Mm. Um, and and I remember we, we had our first kid and then we had our, sec our second child was on the way and I remember waking up one night in the middle of the night and I had, um, my arm was numb. Like completely numb. I tried to shake it out. And, um, you know, normally you get pins and needles and you shake your arm out and then suddenly what happens is um, your arm eventually kind of starts to get the feeling that comes back and um, you feel good. So I shook my arm and nothing happened and it just wasn't like the numbness wasn't kind of going away. Mm -hmm. And so I start to feel that that's a bit weird mm. so I lay down and as I lay down I start to like break out in the sweat like my face starts sweating and then mm. all of a sudden I started to feel like the only way I describe it is really really weak but like almost like I'm slipping away like I felt like I'm I like just felt myself just slipping away and I had like no energy so I turned around to my wow. wife at the time and I said to her honey I think I'm having a heart attack mm. and next minute the paramedics are coming in and I've been uh, you know uh, taken to mm -hmm. Sunnybrook Hospital and the, the doctors are looking at me and was, the whole night I'm kind of there and you know you kind of go into these experiences where I think I showed up there it probably must have been midnight or one in the morning by like the time they'd done all the tests and everything else it was probably like seven or eight o'clock in the morning or something and I remember the doctor coming in and he said to me well whatever you've got um, you uh, it's not going to kill you because we've done every single test and whatever the heck it is it's not deadly at this, this it's point. Not physical. It's not physical. Mm. It's not, it's maybe physical, but it's not deadly physical because we only deal at this part of the medical system. We only deal in things that are going to kill you right now and it's certainly not going to kill you. Um, so I said, what do I do? He said, well, you're going to have to kind of tap into another area of either the medical profession or something else to help you deal with whatever this thing is, but we're out of here. Like it's wow. not our thing, right? Yeah. Um, and good luck for that, but at least on, you know, on the one hand, there was this huge sense of relief that, okay, I'm not dead, I'm not going to die. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, there's a sense of, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to do about yeah. that. And um, interestingly enough, I went to see a traditional Chinese medicine guy, because now I'm like on this thing. Again, it's like this anxiety, what the heck's going on? Um, by the way, this, this, this experience occurred a bunch of times before I went to the TCM okay. guy. Yeah. I kept thinking I was dying of a heart attack or something was happening. I was getting up from the office and walking over. I actually walked into an emergency room at a hospital downtown one day, and the woman said to me, what drugs are you on? And I said, none. She said, well, you look like you're completely high on drugs. Wow. And it was just obviously something was happening in my system. In many ways, um, you, were, like, you were lucky to have someone t tell you that, that, hey, this the medical world is not going to help serve you. Like many people get stuck and just go see one doctor and the other, and it's really their problem is not that. So in, in many ways, you were given that permission to go explore. <laughs> 100%. In fact, I had a great family doctor. He said to me, look, I can give you something if you want. I, my, my sense is this is more closer to the realm of anxiety than anything else. Um, I can certainly give you something for it, but I think you should explore other alternatives yeah. to see how you can help yourself with that. Right. Um, and so... That was, you know, that was kind of neat in a way. Um, I didn't feel like I needed him to help fix me. Um, and so I explored, I went and actually um, met with this guy as a TCM guy. Now, TCM, I'd never had traditional Chinese medicine. And he, what they do is I think he asked me to stick my tongue out and he looks at my tongue. And then he feels my pulse because um, he pushes on it a little bit and, and, and felt, I guess, the different types of pulses that you do have. Mm -hmm. And he looks at me after a bit of this, and he says to me, um, you have almost no yin in your body. Wow. So, well, it's interesting you say that, because I just went, <laughs> so, okay, so what? Like, give me some. Like, uh, what's the big deal, in right? In my head, I'm already <laughs> like, yeah, he makes goes, sense. <laughs> you have virtually no yin in your body. I, I go, yeah. So then he looks at me, he goes, no, you don't understand. He goes, that's actually not a very good thing at all. So I go, why? 
he says to me, well, picture this. He says, you're like this ball of fire, okay? Mm-hmm. And he says, but there's no substance to you in the middle. So there's only a filament of flame on the outside. And he says, there's nothing to you. He says, when I push down on your pulse, I get nothing back. Like there is just almost no life force to you. It's you're, you're basically just burning out. <laughs> so you're just this yang How fire you thing on the outside, just burning out. <laughs> so at that point, I was like, well, that sounds kind of about right because I feel a bit burnt out and, and whatever. Mm-hmm. That feels fine. So I'm still at this point feeling like that's okay. A burning corpse. A burning, burning out. Like, I'm like, okay, big deal. Like I'm sure you'll fix it. And he says to me, but he says, it's not good. I said, why? He says, well, because if you don't address it, he said, first of all, no one's going to tell you this, he says, because if they take your blood, and they probably have, yeah. they will not see it in your blood. And if they assess you physically, it's not, it's not apparent at the physical level in the way that you normally would assess your biology. But the reality is, if you do nothing about it, what's going to happen, and I can tell you what's going to happen in a few years' time, and I don't know if it's five years or ten years or three years, you're going to show signs of some degenerative disease. And I don't know if it's Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, he says, but what's going to happen is people are going to go, well, you're the one in so-and-so at your thing statistically, that, that's what it is, and these are our treatments for it. Yeah. And he says, okay, so here's the thing. The minute he started to say that, I started to really freak out, more anxiety. Um, and then he looks at me and he goes, but it doesn't have to be that way. <laughs> that way. Exactly. Because it doesn't matter how it manifests is what he was trying to tell you. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so he said, it doesn't have to be that way. I said, okay, well, I'm, I'm very much listening to way, how it could be if you, <laughs> if, you, if you tell me. And what he did was he shifted my attention to a landscape where I got to view the world in terms of yin and yang. I'd never viewed anything in terms of yin and yang. I viewed it always in terms of, I want this and this is how I get it and this is how I go from here to there and all of that. But he changed my relationship with the world to viewing the quality of things as they are rather than what they are. Mm. Um, Because you can have water that's boiling or water that's cool. And so the quality makes a big difference to whether it's a yin or a yang. And... I could be speaking in a meeting and I could be highly animated and agitated and filled with yang or I could be speaking in a much slower and more connected and um, calmer pace and that could be more yin and starting to understand that the quality to things um, is relevant. Um, I didn't even know it was there, never mind relevant. And so it changed my relationship with the space and with myself in terms of now being aware of something I had no idea about before. and so for, for a couple of years, I, um, I shifted my attention into looking at things through that lens. And it really changed the way I um, engaged in group meetings and with people. And um, I started to find that I got 10 times more done mm-hmm. with 10 times less effort. It was the weirdest thing. Um, it's almost like the organization, the infrastructure part and the operations part. It just built itself. Right. And all I did was almost hold the space for it while it did that. And I didn't know that that's what I was doing at the time, but it was what came out of the experience of having faced some anxiety or had someone tell me, this is something that you need to deal with mm-hmm. because of the anxiety that you have. And it goes back to that quality versus quantity, which is so simple when we say it, but for you, like it, you know, like your experience um, shows it at a very um, embodied level, really. Yeah. Right, a very embodied level, yeah. um, and um, that was the, that was, I think, the very the the key. Yeah. Um, I discovered later on that the whole anxiety piece was really just the body screaming, "Come home, come back, come back," um, and with an obsessively focused um, corporate warrior attention on my objective, um, I for the longest time would not hear that until it had to send signals like the Meniere's disease or the anxiety attacks or the panic attacks. Um, For whatever reason, I'm a little dense and I'm very tuned in and goal-oriented and focused. And people would say, wow, that's a good thing. You're a goal-oriented, results-oriented kind of guy. And that's great. The problem is it to be so to such an extent that it almost eliminates any ability to see... um, what's really here while you're trying to achieve your goals. I think um, 
certainly drained me of energy and limited me in terms of my potential. And so that was the first inkling that there was some. So what were some of the things you explored to bring some yin into your life? So he, he, he had the observation that you're like a flaming ball and with no core. So what were some of the first things you explored? So two, two things that, that are interesting was one is diet. Um, f- some foods are yin and some are yang. And I was very much into the sugars and the processed foods, um, which are very yang predominant, into the, um, into the red meat was very evidently yang predominant. Um, and so what he said to me is you just got to eat more, um, first of all, fruits and vegetables, um, less processed, um, things that are cooler. He also said to me to eat a lot of stews, Mm-hmm. and things that just sit in, 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 in stews. They're hardy. They will give you some substance. And it's weird because you think, oh, it's, we, we think of that, stu- that um, fruits and vegetables in terms of a, a component of something, but it's more the energy of it that, that has the, the, real, the real impact. So, so diet was, was one piece. It gave me some herbs that were yang predominant, obviously extracted from things that are more the frequency of that energy. Um, the other piece was more activities. He, he kind of steered me in the direction of more. I was doing yoga, and the, the, yoga, the yoga that I had been involved in and practicing was in a, a form of yoga called the Shtanga Yoga. Uh, it was very um, vigorous and very yang predominant in a way. And so he guided me to shift into, um, into exploring activity that was much more yin predominant. So there's yin yoga itself, there's, there's recuperative yoga, and, and more to, to spend time in the meditation realm, to slow it down a lot and spend time more just sitting. Um, so, so those two things, the physical activity side and the, the diet side was a, was a big piece. And I think just being aware that there's such a thing of yin and yang, that's the mental aspect. I think that, that really helped as well. Um, a paradigm shift in your life. A paradigm yeah. shift in my life, 100%, yeah. absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sounds like a helpful framework, um, just so simple because there's two sort of poles to, to look at it, but then I get the sense that it's, it's finding harmony between those two. So it's not that one you know, is, is better than the other, or, but having this awareness that, oh, um, there's a quality to the way you are and the way other people behave and, and the interactions and... And even bringing in food and things we consume also affect this quality. And, correct. And so that sounds like a very helpful model. To- you're, you're 100% correct. I love what you say. You know, I notice so much of the conversation today uh, in all walks of life is very binary, which, which is in my, in my case, I happen to have a massive yin deficiency. So the focus was build up the yin. Um, some people would hear that to say that yang is, is inappropriate or bad or in, in not right. It's like, no, dude, you have so much yang, you don't need to focus on it right now. You don't really need to cultivate that. It's like you've got oodles of it. Rather, just focus on the yin, and then you will come, as you say, into balance where your yang will be supported by the yin, and the, and the yin will be brought into its fullest potential by the yang. Yes. Um, and to have that come into play was really where things started to um, take off for me, absolutely. And, and to see it positively is if, if you have that much yang, then that means you can actually develop that much yin to match the yang that you already have. And, and we do, um, we, like we can, we can acknowledge that our culture is yang oriented and, and that um, just talking about yin, like a lot of people would benefit from slowing down. It doesn't mean that um, living the way that we're living is pathological. It just means that it just needs more integration, more... Um, uh, a whole a holistic approach to living really yes um, yang is um, agitative in nature um, and what I've found is that because we're so familiar with it um, we overlook the biological signals of agitation that call our attention away from what we're currently focusing on that's inappropriate and so we miss the biological signals that are guiding us um, in the challenges that we're facing. And so um, it's very much a part of the work I do at the corporate level, at the, um, um, at the so-called um, yang predominant, in the yang predominant world, um, is to, to help people tune more into the signals that they're experiencing biologically to help them 
um, extract the wisdom out of what's appearing right now that they're unable to see because they're caught up in focusing on something um, to their detriment. So you're, you were beginning to see a shift in, in, in your own quality, as you said, you were going into these new practices and the diet changes. Um, and you also mentioned you're actually sort of paradoxically more productive, but not as depleted as Correct. you were able to do that. What were you starting to move towards after that? What was changing in your life at that point? So it's a really interesting point. I think what a couple of things was, I don't know if I was moving towards it, um, but circumstances were changing where the business had grown to the point where the next phase um, was um, we became much more structured and formal. And I was asked to play a much more um, structured role as opposed to the role that I played before was much more of a, well, just float in and out of wherever you need to be to build whatever needs to be built to deal with whatever is here to be dealt with. Um, and the role changed into, well, we'd like you to be the VP of operations and manage the operations. Um, you can't just waltz into accounting, even though you are an accountant, but that's for the accounting guy to, to deal with. Um, you stay in operations and you have to kind of manage this piece um, very, very well and then trust that everyone else will manage it and then you'll have to kind of meet and integrate with them at different points. And the truth is... Um, that, that's a great role for someone who's built for that, um, but it wasn't something that I really felt drawn to or comfortable with. Um, and I started to feel very much um, tied down, mm. um, constricted, um, and so start to feel more anxious again, mm. <laughs> um, bringing it up again. And um, this time, no matter how much I... I I could, you can't yin your way out of that one, you know what I mean? Like, so, this, so in this case, the anxiety, in the one hand, at first, you know, um, maybe due to um, before, before the, the yin, whatever the anxiety was, at, at, at that point moved into being the anxiety about um, not enough um, yin. Yeah. Now is anxiety about something completely different, which is where do I fit in the world? Wow. Who am I? Like, where do I really belong? What should I be doing next? Um, and I didn't know what, what to do. Um, I, I really struggled with that one. And um, I had to, um, I actually took myself off and I went and spent, I think, uh, two months in Ireland <laughs> in this little retreat center, just hanging out, mm -hmm. walking around in the fresh air, um, trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. Because mm -hmm. um, I really didn't know. Yeah. Um, I remember in, Tro in Toronto, they were building the, the TIFF um, uh, Bell Lightbox building, downtown mm -hmm. Toronto on King Street, and we were right across, right across the street. Um, and I, my office looked out over that gaping hole in the ground that they were building. And it took them about a year to build that. And it took me about a year to watch it being built and just sit all day staring at that um, building, um, trying to figure out what my next thing should be. How, how old um, were you then? Um, I must have been around 40. Mm -hmm. Would, would 40. you consider that a midlife crisis <laughs> in, in a way? Well, very <laughs> crisis clearly. of meaning. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful thing because yeah. it truly, truly, the timing's spectacular. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful way. You could eat, you definitely could nail that one down as a midlife crisis right. for sure. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, there's no yeah. question about it, midlife in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. And so I watched this thing built, and when the building was built, you know, it kind of became clear to me that. I'm not going to make any headway here. I have to leave mm -hmm. in order to figure it out to something we were talking about earlier, the whole courage thing in terms of stepping into something you really don't know what's going to come next. And um, someone asked me a little bit later as to what it was that led me to do that. And the only thing I could come up with at the time was um, I think I was in my, the pain of staying where I was was greater than the fear of stepping into <laughs> what yes. I wanted to step in. Yes. And then that's the equation, right? Absolutely. And that was all it was. And it was like, I can't um, do this anymore. Um, and so I left not knowing what I was going to do next. And I spent some time really just sitting with the, um, the angst, um, trying to, quote, unquote, figure out what the next piece should be. Mm -hmm. that, was a very, um, that was a very interesting interesting piece. And I think the executive coaching, I didn't know that that's what I wanted to do at all. Um, in fact, um, what I actually did was I took the time to, to look at everything I'd ever done 
between my chartered accountant days at Ernst & Young and software consulting days and the, this, this um, um, infrastructure build um, operational days. And I, um, I, I thought, I looked, at, looked over it and, and, and decided to be incredibly hardcore evaluative, if that's the word, um, to see if I really look at everything I've done, where have I gotten results as, as to where people have kind of said, wow, what you've done is really good. And I could clearly know that that was good. And then what did I do to get them? And what was that? And, and what of what I did is absolutely the same across the board. In other words, it never changed no matter what. I want to know what that core thing is. Mm. Um, so what fell by the wayside, because all the, jo- all the jobs were different, was I knew about this or I knew about that or I could do this or I could do that because that job didn't require it. Um, and all I came up with was when people came into my space, they left my space feeling better than when they came in. That was it. And I was horrified. <laughs> I was horrified because because I had to get honest with myself and and when I got to that point of honesty it was like horrifying because I thought holy moly <laughs> like what am I going to do with that like, you who, distilled your values to just like the core the core thing is like who really cares about that right how can I possibly monetize that so it took me a while for a few weeks I actually was just like stunned in a way like okay my 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 actual feeling was one of worthlessness wow. because there's like i don't have anything all i've got is a stupid thing that when people come into my space they feel better when they than when they they leave it feeling better you than know that that's in. everything <laughs> so so it was a weird thing so i sat there and then I, what's what clicked over i had to sit with that for a while and then right. what clicked over was well it can't be that bad if that's the thing that resulted in all the things that actually got the results. I, I hadn't, at the time, I was, I was so um, freaked out by the fact that it was that simple and that kind of benign, in right. a way, like or nothing, yes. that, that I, um, I missed the point that I'd started out by saying, but it's the thing that actually got the big results. So at that point, that's when I realized, okay, it's the thing that got the big results, but it's a tiny thing that doesn't really have substance to it at this point because mm-hmm. I haven't cultivated it in any way. And the um, and one of the things I'd learned from um, the president of the company who had um, who I'd helped build this with had always um, guided us when we were, when he was a successful entrepreneur and. Um, built lots of businesses and he always said to me the only thing that matters is value he says i don't build a business for any other reason i look to see where's the value and if i can see value then don't be scared that other people can see it yeah. he says if you can see value then your role then is just to do you want to just cultivate it okay. and he said that's a very difficult thing because there's nothing at the time that's going to prove itself out at this stage he said but the funny thing is is if you spend enough time cultivating the value What's going to happen is eventually other people are going to see it. And he says, and when they're going to see it, they're going to want it. And it's worth a lot more than when you originally started cultivating it. So that's how he builds businesses and then sells them because then they're worth a lot more. He said, but the the cultivating value is a very difficult thing. No one wants to do that. It's scary. It's challenging. It's never been done before because it's in its infancy. And we don't know how to do it. And that's a real struggle. It can be slow. It can take time. It can take a ton of time. You don't know. And it takes a fair amount of courage to do that at the deepest level. And I decided, you know what? Everything I've done up until this point had been um, surface-driven in a way. But the anxiety that I'd been feeling was an existential angst around my place in the world. And it felt like if I'm going to find my rightful place in the world, I better start with what's the core piece of what I'm here to, what I can offer people of value. Otherwise, I've got nothing to offer. Mm-hmm. It's all just learnt. And so I just started to, and I actually just started to meet with people. I went out and chatted with people and spoke with people. And um, after a little while, people would say to me, you know, it's really interesting. I'm, I get a really good feeling that if you could, could you do me a favor and come in and speak with, with Pamela in my organization? I just have a feeling that she's going through something. If you could just sp- spend some time with her, um, it would really help her. And I think it would really, you know, she's got so much talent, but she's just missing something in some place 
And my sense is you could really help her based on the way I'm hearing you speak. And so I would say, just fine, not a problem. And that turned into, wow, she's really turned around. What did you do? And I'm like, I don't really know. I just kind of sat and listened and spoke <laughs> and I don't know what I'm doing. Wow. Um, and so over time, I started to have these engagements with people in a corporate setting and only corporate because I didn't know what other setting really to, to hang out in because that's kind of where I came from. And so people would have these experiences where they became more productive or they became better at what they were doing or they understood their problem better or whatever it was. And it became more clear to me over time that, oh, right, they feel better after spending time with me because they became more clear about something and that's what made them feel better. So that really the value is in providing clarity, clarity to people. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's when I put up my website, which was Clarity Guidance Results. I didn't call myself an executive coach. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. Yes. Um, and I had no formal training. I didn't kind of um, have a certification or anything. I didn't know what that was all about. And so I started to cultivate this value, grow this business, meet with people and connect with people over time. And eventually discovered that what I was really doing was this thing called executive coaching. Mm. And so that's how, how that came about. Um, the cool part about it was that because I had never taken a course, I never had a paradigm to work with. I just got to work with people as they are and synthesize that information into my own body as I am. And so I got to discover some really cool stuff about the things that hold people back because all I would do all day was be sitting with people and all they would tell me was, what's a problem? Where do they want to go? Why they can't go there? What's in the way? What's not in the way, what they wish they had, and, and unpack this with, with every single different type of person you can imagine um, in the context of what they consider to be the biggest problem or challenge that they're facing to date. I learned so much, you cannot believe it. I mean, I couldn't believe it because what it felt like was that they were paying me to discover what's inside of me that's holding me back. That's amazing. Oh, it's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, it was unbelievable. So the, fulfilling. <laughs> the, the yang part of me is like, okay, so what's the code? Like you clearly have like cracked the code and let's, let's spit out the 10, you know, secret right. blocks yeah. that people it's, it's feel. So, but it's so interesting. So only The yang part of me wants to just sit and enjoy this. <laughs> I know, it's so cool, it's so cool. Like it's, it's awesome, it's brilliant, it's so awesome. <laughs> So, so they're, they're, they're actually funny. It's the two together that actually has the, the thing. There's only one, there was only one. There's no ten. That's the really cool part. And um, mm. what, what I discovered is that um, in facing our challenges, um, we overlook our biological experience. Ah. And so um, what I realized that there was a significant amount of people that I was helping bring them back to the biological aspect of their challenge, um, not the conceptual aspect of their challenge. They're all very, very strong conceptually. I mean, these are people who have gone through university and programs and all kinds of things and are able to conceptualize and think through very complex things. So their thinking mechanism is perfectly fine. And they were struggling with a problem because the problem has an aspect of it that isn't thinking related. And so to assist them to process information in a non-cognitive way um, is completely at odds with that landscape. Um, and so the piece that, that was missing was really, you were, I would say, is the um, connection to one's own um, sense of self or presence. And that gets heard as a, in a conceptual way. Um, it, it's nowhere near like what people actually hear it to be. Um, so that's when I changed my website relatively recently to um, what if your problem isn't what you think it is? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because most of the things that we're doing are all about how we're framing them up. And, it's um, more experiential. Yeah. Yep. And in a way, it's like, um, I'm so tempted to say this, I'm going to say it. Um, it feels like you're humanizing the corporate world. Because a lot of time people just make it sound like, oh, the corporate world. And it's like very, you know, it's, it's as if this entity that's not... But it is a human world. Mm -hmm. It is. And we need more of that. We actually, like, there's no way we're going to dismantle corporations. I mean, that, that's what we're made of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is our society. This is our culture. So how do we humanize that world? Is, it feels like this is part of what you're doing. Yes. And what I'm discovering is that what's great about it is that 
the approach that I'm being led to take is not in the um, it's not in the cerebral realm, so it 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 almost it almost doesn't get caught up with or get trapped in or get tied up in um, all the the trappings of the complex thinking dynamic yes. because it leaves it alone to be as it is so I don't mess with it. Right. Um, and what I'm really doing is expanding the perspective around a problem to say, well, that's great that you've described your problem as the fact that you don't have enough resources to do this particular job. But tell me, what does it feel like in your body when you think about that problem? Mm. And the first thing is, is most people don't even know how to even answer that because they go, what's my body got to do with it? Mm. And the answer is everything because you're the one that's being tasked with solving it and your body is intelligent and it has information for you to solve that particular problem, actually, because I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't want to help you get a result in solving that problem. But the reality is, is that you're missing a ton of information and your body can offer it to you, just like it offered it to me each time I was having these panic and anxiety attacks that I was kind of so bluntly and blatantly ignoring. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's an interesting process to take people down. Absolutely, thinking with your body. <laughs> thinking, with, yeah, literally, yeah, yeah. or I would call it processing with your body. Yes, yeah, yeah. And so people learning to actually process information rather than think, rather than believe the only way to process information is through thinking. Um, and, and see what arises as a result of that processing. And it's been quite remarkable um, mostly what we found is, what I've found is that a big chunk of it is um, people's inability to be with biological discomfort. And so we short circuit the biological discomfort by latching onto ideas that we can play over and over and over again as somehow a promise that if we kind of figure them out, then the discomfort will go away. But the reality is, is we're, we're suppressing and masking the discomfort um, and we're not opening to the information that the discomfort is, is sharing. Um, so we can't become um, better delegators because we're terrified to delegate. You've learned all there is to know about delegating and you're still not delegating. Well, why is that? Well, because it's biologically uncomfortable to delegate. Mm -hmm. um, you you want to have executive presence, but the reality is, is standing in the feelings of um, agitation in a meeting where people are sharing information you don't agree with is too uncomfortable for you to do, so therefore you talk when you shouldn't talk or you interrupt when you shouldn't interrupt and therefore you don't have any presence and it's because you're too uncomfortable to experience the discomfort of presence. And so people starting to re having to learn that actually um, they have to become more aware of themselves biologically so that they can actually shift beyond the limitations that their current tolerance level is um, holding them. It's, it sounds tricky because if, if one is used to this, this uh, strategy against you know, uh, minimizing the discomfort by turning away, and I'm hearing in you is sort of a suggestion that perhaps it's actually towards or, or there's a relationship with the discomfort that needs to be uh, explored there. But that that's, must be so hard, especially somebody going through with uh, an intense anxiety experience and their body is numb and there's pain. And, and you know, um, so how do you, how do you coach somebody? Oh my God, that's so much fun. Oh my God, that's the <laughs> best part. So, so the thing that I've discovered, the thing that I discovered is that um, there are two components to information. Um, there's the thinking component and there's what I would call the charge component. The charge component is the part of the information that's being conveyed or you're being experienced that you feel it on your cells in your body. It's like electricity almost. And that charge component could be positive, negative, and it could be really very intensely positive or really intensely negative, but it's there. So if I said to you, how's that assignment coming? Uh, I've said, how's that assignment coming? And that's like four words. But the truth is, you felt a whole lot of stuff when I said that to you. And depending on what was going on, you'd feel a different thing. If you'd completed your assignment and going really well, you'd feel different to, oh, I'm behind the gun on that, or something bad's going to happen. 
So there's a charge component to that. The problem with this is, is that um, people um, don't know, aren't aware of that, of that charge component. And it's that charge component that sets in motion the focus to really want to fixate on the thinking part of the problem. And what happens is that when we do that, because the charge can't be processed, because we're using the wrong part of our brain, what we do is we cover up that charge with thinking and we pretend it's, it's really about some thought. So you would say to yourself, if let's say someone said to me, Jonathan, you didn't get the promotion. There'd be a charge component to that information and the cover-up of that charge component would be thoughts like, um, I didn't want it anyways, mm -hmm. or what a, what a bunch of assholes this company is and they never liked me anyway and I don't like them, or whatever that is, which has nothing to do with the verbal side, which is simply you didn't get the promotion. It could be a million reasons, but my brain is now putting that all into the space because it's really converted charge, trying to pretend to be relevant information, masquerading as verbal things. It's, it's kind of noise in the way. So people, when I'm having a, a session with someone, what happens is they are experiencing these two things together, which is why they're struggling with whatever problem they're having. Part of their problem is that there is verbal information that's relevant and then a ton of verbal information that's completely irrelevant, that's really unprocessed charge. And so in a coaching dynamic, what I have to do is I've got to sit in the space and I have to process the charge on their behalf. So what happens is as we're having a conversation, I can feel that charge because I'm feeling it in my body, not in their body. I can feel the uncomfortable situation. And my role is to to be connected to the sensations of that charge in a way where I don't go cerebral. So what, what really happens in this case is a bit bizarre to share with people because it mm -hmm. would seem like I'm, I'm not really doing a lot or it's very dangerous. But there's chunks of space where people are talking to me and I don't, I'm not interpreting or listening to a word they say in the traditional sense but I'm absolutely 100% present to what they're saying, but it's being processed non-thinking wise until what happens is something that they say hits my brain in a way where I go, oh, that makes sense. Now I can talk about that. And so what often happens is someone will speak to me for 20 minutes and say a whole bunch of complicated, complex things that's really all kinds of stuff and I'm just sitting processing the charge. And what happens is when something comes in terms of the verbal thing that makes sense, it'll make sense to me. Otherwise, it won't make sense to me. It's all noise. And when it makes sense to me and I share it with them, they go, how did you just get that from everything I just said? That's exactly what I was trying to say, but I couldn't say it with everything that was there. Wow. And the, weird, the crazy thing is it always kind of nails it because – as long as I'm trusting the fact that I just stay away from everything that's charge-based and just process it, then what's left is obviously relevant in some way. Don't know what way. And then we can work with it. Now, what happens there is because I've found the one piece of relevant information, all the charge can then no longer come up because what's going to happen is as they start to work with that, they've tracked a little deeper into their problem. So they've gotten a little further than where they were before because before they were at some point in the process where all that other information seemed so relevant. So now they're further along in the process because now they've got a piece of information that's much more relevant than all of that. And so then what happens is all of a sudden, if they don't know how to process charge within a day, an hour, a week or whatever, what's going to happen is the new, more charge is going to come into this space. It's going to make that progress where they have feel like they're trapped again. Mm. And so unless they know how to process the charge of their um, experience, they are constantly beholden almost to someone who's going to process it on their behalf, which is why I started to put together workshops and programs to help people process their own charge, calling it something, I don't even know what I called it, but it's something that says um, um, recalibrating of, um, the art and science of finding clarity in a noisy world. Because you're trying to use um, language to describe something that's non nonverbal. Yes, nonverbal. Yeah. It's, yeah. And, and the thing is, is that the actual part of the brain, it's the parietal lobe that actually processes nonverbal information, and the frontal lobe processes verbal information. And so 
you actually, by being in the sensation of something, can process nonverbal information. And by process it, I mean move it away from the frontal lobe that is being burdened by it. It's almost like cleaning up the malware on your processor. And so then it gets freed up and it goes, wow, I can do all this stuff that I couldn't do before because it's no longer um, submerged under a whole bunch of um, malware, for mm-hmm. example. Yeah. So this, this ability that you discover to filter relevance sounds like it's a trainable muscle because you just mentioned that Correct. You, you have developed workshops to try to Correct. enhance that. Um, what's coming to my mind is, is just curious around how you discern what is relevant and what is not relevant? What is noise? What's Such signal? a great question. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, um, so it took me a while to really get clear on what are the fundamental things, but there are four signals that you can tap into biologically um, that are guaranteed to tell you that right now you need to process at a nonverbal level. The first one is agitation. So you'd say to me, no, come on, Jonathan, if I'm agitated, there's got to be something. And the truth is 100%. If you're agitated, if you're biologically agitated, you should be processing non-verbally. If you are constricted in some way, you should be processing non-verbally. If you're tense in some way, you should be processing non-verbally. If you're euphoric in some way, you should be processing non-verbally. And the, the most difficult, that's, the first three are tough for people but they get there because they can relate in some ways. Euphoria is a tougher one. The most difficult one, the last one, is if you're feeling any dissociation, oh. you, um, you need to be processing um, non-verbally too. And how does, that, how does one experience that? Can you describe? Dissociation? Yep. Very, very difficult to, to know because the dissociative process is one of making you believe that you, everything's okay because you're genuinely not feeling anything because you've generally cut off from the feeling. So now that's, that's like, you, you, it's like you're going up. Let's call it up and out. Yeah. That's exactly how it's described is up and out. And so the thing is, is what I've found is giving people a paradigm doesn't help. It almost like that's the one where they need a reference point in the coaching to have, to be with someone where they experience themselves up and out and bring them ever so slightly back to a particular sense of being um, and then to feel what that feels like to have a reference point for it. Um, and it's very, very difficult to work with. Um, and so those are the people that um, they're often considered uncoachable um, mm-hmm. at, uh, in the leadership realm because People don't like their behavior, but they can't recalibrate to adjust their behavior because they're too heady. And so um, and they find themselves moved into spaces where they are much more working on things than working with people um, in, in some ways. Um, if they are working with people, they do it in a very, very highly evolved cerebral way that makes them seem like they're very smart and figured out because they have, their brain has figured out how to outmaneuver any way of feeling anything biologically. So they appear really better at being in tune than anyone else, but the fact is they're 100% out of tune. They're the most dangerous people in that space because everyone will think that they really got it going on. It's like a very evolved compensation. Very evolved compensation. And I can relate because I've been there. Mm -hmm. So it takes one to know one. And so I can call it out. And I've made the mistake of calling it out. And and the thing is, (laughs) it's not going to work because no one's going to get it, right? It's right back. It's like, but the thing is, what I have learned is not to co-create with the interference of the verbal. So... If someone's giving me all their legitimate reasons for whatever, that's absolutely fine. I don't have to add my perspective into it verbally. It's, it's not part of the, the process. It's not what I do. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that's um, It's interesting, interesting that you use that word, that non-coachable. That's, um, that's very interesting because, you know, it, then it's probably another realm that they need to um, experience or maybe... 
yeah, I mean, other issues to address there. There are yeah. some people who are coachable in that realm, but that's yeah. normally where you'd find a lot of people who are considered uncoachable to be. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. where they, they fall in that category because people just throw their hands up at some yeah, level. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you share more about the nonverbal? I'm, I'm interested mm-hmm. in so that, that level of processing. So maybe in the context of like making a decision. So someone's got a really tough scenario and a decision needs to be made. And okay. then they have those experiences that I forget which one's agitation was one of them. So they're, sure. okay, maybe, so, yeah. So how about we do this? Um, I'll take you through something and you'll, you'll see if you, um, you can do it. So um, if, you, um, if you put your hand on your lap right now you could, you can, and your palm faced upwards, you can f- if you put your attention on the sensation of your hand, you can feel the sensation of your hand, I would assume. That's yeah. biological, you can feel the sensation. Now, when you're putting your attention on the sensation of your right hand, what's actually happening is you're activating neurons in the parietal lobe of your brain because the parietal lobe is where you feel sensation. Different parts of your body feel different sensation. It feels sensation based on where they are connected in the parietal lobe. So if you're putting your attention on your right hand, you will activate the sensation neurons in that area of the brain. Now, what you can do as an experiment is think about a scenario that you find highly challenging or agitating. So do you have one that you can think of? That, uh, that just even the project of this podcast, like there's certain perfect. challenges. That, yeah. Okay, so when you start to think about it, um, what does it feel like in your body when you think about that challenge? Well, I noticed the moment I started talking about it, I actually forgot about my right hand. So that was the first thing I noticed, sure. the and, loss and of connection. Yes, and what happens to your body? A little tighter around the chest. Okay, great. Okay, so so perfect. So as you think about the project, there's some tightness in your chest. Now, the tightness is some form of constriction. So the first problem we have is most people aren't aware that they tighten their chest. So people have to become more self-aware, and you have to start practicing. And so we'll talk about that in a second. But I'll take you through this, and I'll bring you back to what you can do to practice. So if you now put your attention on the sensation of your hand, and I say to you, okay, we're going to play a game. What we're going to do is your role is to stay focused on the sensation of your hand at all costs. So it's the primary attention. But while you're doing that, bring in the idea of the challenge you have around the project and see how the two can coexist to the extent that you have to stay in sensation and see what happens. So tell me what happens when you start to do that. Well, I'm starting to notice that I can do that. So I'm maintaining focus on my right hand. It's, yeah. it's a little cool. I can feel the air. I'm starting to run through scenarios of the stressors about this project and deadlines and that sort of thing. But I'm still feeling the sensation still of the in hand. contact with my hand. How does your chest feel? That was actually interesting. So not as tight. So when I was noticing that, when I turned attention, it was actually just occupying more volume. Okay. And so while you're staying in the sensation of your hand, so you're putting attention on it, what is your relationship to the challenge that you had before compared to your relationship to the challenge um, now? It, it doesn't seem as, as big of a challenge. Okay. So what you've done is you've, in that process, as long as you're processing the charge of the challenge, because if you're not processing the charge of the challenge and take, feel what happens if you take your attention away from your hand, the charge will come back of that challenge mm-hmm. related and you will start to feel the constriction and your possibilities will narrow. It's really so now if you want to face the challenge, you want to expand your possibilities of what's there. And so you're going to have to process the charge like we spoke about. You have to, you have to literally be in a nonverbal thing. It has nothing to do with the problem as you think it, but everything to do with the problem as it's being experienced. Wow. In this so case, in the body, specifically. In the body, your body. Now what happens is now you can actually face your, your, your challenge. So the big problem with this is that, first of all, people aren't aware that they're either agitated, constricted, or tense in their body to begin with. And so you ha- what has to happen is they have to build up, uh, they have to start a practice of strengthening the muscle that would alert them to the fact that they actually are agitated, constricted, or tense. And so the way they would do that is they could sit for five or ten minutes in the morning when they get up in the morning, the first thing they do, and sit and put their attention on the sensation of their hands or their feet and just feel sensation. And do that for five or ten minutes before you go to bed at night, just before you go to sleep. Now, what's remarkable about that is that that activates neurons in the, in the brain in the parietal lobe. But what it's going to do is if you do it for long enough and for regular enough, it starts to form neurosynaptic connections, which means that now you start to actually form new, more neural pathways 
And those neural pathways are like your muscle building. And so you will start to feel things you never felt before. It's weird. I've had clients who say to me, dude, okay, that's great. Three weeks ago, you told me to do this practice. And what I can tell you is that since I've been doing it, I felt nothing but agitated and anxious. And it's making it worse. And what I often say to them, almost all the time, is, well, what's, what it's showing me is not that it's making you agitated or anxious. It's that you're finally aware of how agitated and anxious you actually are in the thing. You've now raised your level of awareness to something you weren't aware of before. So now you may not like it, but the fact is all, but you're now at least in contact with discomfort that you were completely not in contact with. So then the other piece is, is to include that, in, to expand the practice to maybe every hour for a minute, have something beep on your phone or something and say sensation and you feel sensation for an, a minute. And then the other piece is during activities such as driving your car or going for walks or, you know, um, watching TV, see why you're doing it if you can be in sensation while it's occurring. What I often do is I take people through a real uh, a quick exercise to show them that nothing bad's going to happen because when you're in sensation, you're not actually interfering with your frontal lobe. So your frontal lobe can process perfectly fine. So if someone goes to sensation and stays completely in sensation, I could say to them, what's 10 times 3? And they no problem with answering 30 while in sensation. At first, they're binary. I often catch them. They go 30 and I go, you left sensation, didn't you? And they go, oh my God, I didn't realize that. And so at first they have to get to sensation. But what they discover is that there isn't a time when they're in sensation that their frontal lobe becomes stupid or can process or they forget how to drive or they don't change lanes at the right time or actually things improve because the charge component that's masquerading as relevant information isn't there. So they become a better driver and um, they're, they're cooking food or making tea or doing something or vacuuming the house in a way that's much more um, cohesive and integrated Joyable. and in alignment. Yeah. Enjoy. Yeah. They start to feel more enjoyment, but not because from the outside it's making them any happier. It's just that there's less stuff pushing on them. Yeah. It, it, this it's is like, amazing. It's like <laughs> increasing the vividness of, of their sensations. Correct. And so both painful and pleasant like in, in, getting in, real that's right getting real with your with yourself and learning ultimately to accept the reality of whatever is here but not cognitively because cognitively i could talk myself into accepting it but the truth is i don't really my body's agitated so why don't i accept that reality and just be with the agitation in a non-judgmental way but not non-judgmental in the way we think about it non-judgmental in the way where you're not thinking about it at all it's not judging it at all you're just really processing it. Um, so it's not for everybody because that takes courage because you're only going to kind of do that if A, it's very clear to you that this is something that's relevant and it doesn't promise anything because it's not embedded in the realm of the cognitive that says, well, if you do this and this will help and then you'll get here and then you'll speak to him and then this will... Um, it doesn't do that. It, it really just um, offers you a avenue beyond what you've tried for however many times you've tried it and realized that wasn't working and so you'll try something else. I feel like someone listening would say, well, wh what's the point of going outside of my comfort zone if it's going to hurt? <laughs> right, um, right. And yeah. so it's, it's, it's the only analogy I have for most of my clients is the weightlifting one or the mm -hmm. gym where two people could walk into a gym and they both want to get stronger. And so that's kind of the point. Um, one person, they both pick up the weights and one person goes, that hurts. And the other person goes, that hurts. And the second person went, that hurts and goes, oh, ooh. And they put it down. They go, that's not for me. I can't deal with it. And the other person goes, well, you're telling me that if I keep lifting this weight, my muscles are going to get stronger. And I go, yes. And they go, but it hurts. I go, what's going to happen is if you keep doing it, your relationship with the pain is going to change. That I can guarantee you that if you keep lifting those weights and doing that, Within a short period of time, it won't, the pain will still be there, but the way you feel it will be very different. And so you almost will start to enjoy the pain, and the pain is no different. And in fact, what's going to happen is when you start to get stronger and that weight becomes we, um, um, lighter, you're going to want to put more weight on to get more pain. And they go, really? I go, that's how this works. So this is the same thing. So, and results. And I mean, results. Yeah. And so the, the idea behind wanting to face your 
your pain, insecurity, whatever those agitative biological discomforts, is that at the at the behind your biological comfort discomforts are the things you deeply desire or want at the deeper level, not at the level of like I want more money, but at the deeper level of I, I want more of myself in the world. I want more of whatever that thing is that I'm I'm trying to track towards. And I can come into alignment with it because I'm blocked. Mm -hmm. And I know deep down that I would be a better leader. And I know deep down that I know what to do. But the truth is I'm scared. And the thing is, absolutely. And so scared would mean you're agitated, you're constricted, you're tense. You need to process the, the charge that's commensurate with you being scared so that you can ultimately experience a little bit more space to inch your way forward into the land that you would normally never go into. And then that's the way you will get the results. But to paint some wonderful map that's cognitive will not yield the result because the minute you feel uncomfortable, your brain will short circuit and tell you why you're not, today is not a good idea to, to go there. Yeah, and, and just to piggyback off that analogy with exercise, this is, it's coming to mind the importance of having different ways to approach the practice and finding one that suits you because there are many forms of exercise and maybe, maybe running on a treadmill isn't enjoyable, but perhaps, you know, doing, doing stretches and, and lifting weights might actually be your, your jam. And so in this case, you know, as you're describing these practices, there, there seems like there's overlap with this, this mindfulness um, popularity. And, and within that, like exercise, there are many offerings, many techniques, many different traditions, um, that sort of thing. Is, is, that, is it intentional that you didn't want to use that word mindfulness? Because uh, I know it, it, it does there is a current phenomenon happening with the popularity and the commercialization of it? It's a good question. Um, you know, I started, funnily enough, a little while ago, I started to kind of jump on the mindfulness bandwagon, thinking that that was where I was going until I actually worked with someone who helped me um, get a little bit more clear about where I am going. And what came out of that is um, this idea that, for me at least, it's not about a concept like mindfulness. Yes. Um, it's about my own journey. And so what, what the answer that I got was, for me, it's beyond mindfulness, not because mindfulness is irrelevant, but because if I started getting stuck in the concept of mindfulness personally for me, Absolutely. it would hold me back because then I'd be beholden to mindfulness as a thing and I'd have to become an expert in mindfulness. And I don't want to be an expert in mindfulness. There are plenty of those. Um, I just want to kind of do my weird and wacky thing and learn from it and share. And if there's something useful that comes out of it, then people will take it and go, this is exactly, I can see what you're doing. There's so much commonality to mindfulness. In fact, I've had a lot of people say to me, now I get mindfulness, whereas I never got it before. Now I can see the relevance of it. I'm like, great, awesome. Go play in mindfulness, go play in whatever you want to play in. Um, for me, it was much more simple um, as to the fact that it's more about simply finding a way to access a part of yourself that you're overlooking um, while you're struggling with something. And, and it's very, like, for me, like, it's so tempting. I'm, I'm, I'm connecting it to different traditions, what you're saying. I'm connecting it to psychology. Um, when you talk about the charge and how, how, you know, when you don't process the charge, it'll come back. It really is about our unconscious patterns and our complexes is what it is. And, like, you know, when you talked about um, the non-coachable or uncoachable people, well, I'm thinking maybe it's time for, that, for those type of people to um, explore psychotherapy and go deeper and then come back to the coachable world. Exactly. So, you know, these are the connections that I'm making, but it's just so important to um, see the experiential side when you talk about it, like it being embodied and practical. And because um, a lot of people look at meditation like that's a waste of time. But when you talk about go into sensation, take a break while you're working, go into sensation. That's meditation in a way. <laughs> no, it totally is. It, it absolutely is. It's much more in alignment with the, I think it's the Vipassana meditation mm -hmm. where it's around feeling and yes. um, being tuned in at that level, your breath, your sensations. Um, so absolutely. And what I really, I love what you said. When you, were, when you were just talking right now, I was really loving it because you, what, you, what you're sharing is about the relevance of everything. Yes. And, and, and that's what I love. It's this idea that somehow one thing is better than another. It's like, yeah. no, one no. thing's more appropriate for Bob because he needs that right now. But Sally needs that Absolutely. right now. And the more we can learn about all the wonderful things that are out there, the more we can kind of find the perfect meal to suit the perfect body that, in that way. Um, and each person's completely unique. Yes. And yes. so... That makes it a complete crapshoot if you think that somehow we're going to take completely unique people 
in completely unique situations and put on some kind of thing that says, well, this is the, the way in which we should approach things. Um, it's no fun anyway. It's much more fun to play in a more magical way to say, well, let's see what's going on. And, and it, let's and see it, what's and, out there. Yes, and people become overwhelmed by all these ideas and concepts and just turn away. And it's such a waste because there's an opportunity for everyone to grow and, and live an authentic life, really. Someone said to me the other day, I was talking about how I'm going to... Um, someone said to me, well, you should be speaking. And I said, well, I don't quite know what to say and what's the message and where to speak. And they said, well, um, why don't you just hire a coach and follow the breadcrumbs? And I think the follow the breadcrumbs was the piece that really... Mm -hmm is what you're saying is as there's people are scared and the truth is because we all want to kind of have it planned out and know how it's going to turn out and the truth is sometimes you have to kind of maybe do some yin yo yoga before you find out that it's meditation that's your thing and you have to go through of trying out a few things before you you discover that maybe psychotherapy was the answer and not the medication but you have to yeah. take some medication then you have to do this and then you have to do that and you find your way there and it's not because medication was bad it was because it, that's how you had to figure out that what the next thing you had to do and sometimes you figure out that it was good until it wasn't anymore it was relevant until it's not and so when we stop being so binary about things in a way where things have to be in or out, and if they're out, they're bad, and if they're in, they're good, we can start to be more, oh, just so much more at ease expansive. with things. Expansive. and allow things to kind of um, come into our space and leave our space too when they're not relevant and not to say, well, no, now I'm onto the new thing and it's wrong. It's like, no, I'm onto this because it's, it's where I'm at right now, not because where it should be. Yes, yeah. Could, could, should, would. <laughs> yeah, really. Totally, totally, yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just this conversation right now, I'm taking moments to check into my sensations as I'm listening to when you guys are speaking and I'm just sort of... I'm buzzing. <laughs> yeah, and, and there are moments where actually I'm also reminded that there are, there are moments where nothing needs to be said either, right? So like sitting in that silence and just sort of processing the body sensations, it's like actually, yeah... I don't need to add any more right now, right? And the, how important that insight is that I'm just connecting right now, um, maybe in like a brainstorming session. You know, you're with a group of friends and you're trying to brainstorm ideas. And sometimes it's to not always be providing input and adding to it, but it's just to kind of hold that awareness, open that perception, you know, bring in more information to sit with it. Yeah. And as you were saying that, I was thinking about something you had mentioned, uh, Jonathan, earlier um, about wanting to be like more of yourself in the world. Um, and, and that's so important to be fully present, to be more of ourselves and to get there. Yes. Courage, but also to, it's going to sound very um, cheesy, but to really love ourselves yeah. <laughs> to allow it to come out into the world. Yeah. yeah. Um, what I've discovered um, is that part of loving myself is being honest with myself about what I hate about myself um, because then it can at least be acknowledged and felt um, and can be aired. Yes. Um, and what a lot of people misperceive is that loving themselves is telling themselves positive things about themselves all the time. But what I've found is being ruthlessly honest with ourselves um, and, and, being, and having the courage um, to allow for that is probably the greatest self-love we can um, direct towards ourselves because it's the deepest acceptance of whatever is really here, um, as opposed to sanitizing what's here in favor of what I think I should be or what's appropriate for me or trying to be better than where I was two minutes ago. And the Absolutely. truth is we're only as good as what, what we are in the moment. Absolutely. And being honest with ourselves, um, it goes both ways. It doesn't, it's not about being critic, harshly, harshly critical or just sugarcoating everything. It's just like you said, I'm scared. I'm yeah. I'm embarrassed. I'm mm -hmm. ashamed. I'm uh, I'm I'm concerned, or I'm worried, or um, I'm happy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm happy. Some people you can't believe they don't want it. They they're scared to be happy, and wow. some people are, are are terrified to be scared. And it's it's just because we don't necessarily. Everyone's got their own pattern, and so we can't really. No, it's not typical to know what the, the thing is, but what it is, is whatever the pattern is, is this holdback from feeling what, what is legitimately deep down already being felt at some level, but 
And for some people, feeling joy is actually a profoundly uncomfortable experience. Um, it's because it's different and it's unsafe. And it means that I've taken my eye off the ball and I haven't been whipping myself hard enough and something bad's going to happen. So it's, it's um, for some people, you know, feeling joy would be appropriate. But then again, for other people, um, they're caught up in only feeling joy because there's a sense of if I'm not feeling happy or joyfully pleasurable experiences, then there's something bad going on. And so they shy away from feeling a negative experience and owning it or experiencing it, sharing it with the world or themselves at least first. Right. Yeah, what I'm sensing right now is that trying to sort of bring this, even this conversation to a close, like there's something in my body that just kind of reacts. It's like, oh, let's, let's find a place to kind of close it. Um, is there anything you want to share with listeners as far as, um, because we started this conversation with your, with your story and there were so many juicy things that we dove into, but now also I, I kind of want to bring that story mode back and, and, and just a place that you feel comfortable um, leaving the audience. So I think um, what comes up for me is, is that and if I think about where I've been and the journey I've been on and things I've learned on, on the journey, um, it's, um, it's all really about um, being with whatever's there and allowing it to reveal itself fully. Um, a lot of what we try and do is almost project out um, in an abstract way, um, what I want and how I think I'm going to get there. And, you know, I do a lot of strategic planning with organizations. It's not a bad thing. Um, but sometimes if what's underneath is agitative or constrictive or tense or we're feeling depressed about something, so I'm going to now, while I'm in my constricted, depressed state, I'm going to try and project out where I want to be and the things I think I'm going to do while I'm depressed, it, 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 takes away from the experience of what I'm actually occurring. And so I don't, what's actually occurring, I don't get to experience it. So what I would say is um, to, in addition to the strategic planning and the figuring out where we want to go, which has absolute relevance in this world, let's not get that wrong, mm -hmm. um, we can include um, in that process a willingness to be with biological discomfort and the sensations as they are where we are in that moment, just for a little bit more than what we would normally be with, um, to see what in that being with it um, arises, what opens up, what, um, what transpires, five, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, see what happens, because that five or 10 or 15 minutes is five or 10 or 15 minutes longer than you've ever done before. And so you're giving yourself five or 10 or 15 minutes of a possibility you've never had before, and then we don't know what will come up in your brain in terms of giving you more strategic direction or what you think you could do next. Um, and that might be the very thing you need to have revealed in order for you to be inspired. Sounds beautifully terrifying. I love it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Jonathan, thank you so much for, for joining us. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks for having me, guys. Have you ever been loved like that? Your love comes to me from a place that is beyond linear time and thought. It knows no language or physical space. Have you ever been loved like that? I loved you in my weakness, but in my strength my love for you expands to carry us both into the ancient country of the heart. Have you ever been loved like that? My love for you knows no language. It makes me want to be a human laden with the burdens and grace of this world. Have you ever been loved like that? For years I roamed the woods looking for the ineffable between the veins of a leaf and the cracks of a tree trunk, but I found it between the crevices of your body and the wetness of your lips. Have you ever been loved like that?
I found it in your eyes and the lilt of your voice, the cracks of your pain. I found it in the ocean of our conversations that come and go, but you come and go. One day you are here, one day you are not. When you are here, I say, this is it. This is love and I prepare for battle because our bond is sacred and I want to protect it. But when you are not here, I feel that and I know that you have never been loved like that. Hope you enjoyed this episode. You can find links and show notes at soulspacepodcast.com. Next episode, we chat with meditation teacher Jeff Warren about consciousness exploration. Follow us on social media at soulspacepod. That's soulspace P-O-D. Please leave us a review on iTunes. Thanks again for tuning in. Until next time. Mm-hmm.